Hi, welcome to Creation Care Church Friday Friday Night Live message. And this week's topic, is it more Christ-like to defend animals or to defend people's freedom to hurt animals? So which of those two is more Christ-like? So while we're waiting for people to get started, I have an announcement to make. Uh, if you go to our website, creationcarechurch.org slash volunteer, there's a new page with volunteer opportunities. So if you'd like to get more involved with Creation Care Church, there's a list of uh, mostly small tasks that you could do that would greatly benefit us and allow us to continue to grow, get this message to more people, and really make this a more inviting community. And so if you'd like to volunteer a little bit of your time, there's a list of opportunities. Again, creationcarechurch.org slash volunteer. So please look at that, and if anything stands out to you, pray about it. Uh, reach out to us, and we'll get in contact with you. So thank you for everyone who's been sharing, everybody who's been donating financially, uh, everyone who's been donating their time. Uh, and if you'd like to get more involved in any of those opportunities, go to our website. So again, this week's talk, is it more Christ-like to defend animals or to defend people's freedom to hurt animals? So let's start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for your word. Thank you for everyone who's coming together to hear this message. And we just ask that you give us wisdom and guidance in this topic and really reveal to us your character. Uh, what is your character and how can we reflect that character in how we live our lives? And with regard to this topic, uh, let us know whether it's defending your creatures that reflects your character or whether it's defending uh, the freedom people may or may not have to hurt your creatures. So just be with us uh, as we go through this topic. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And this topic was inspired by Timothy Verrett, who really wanted us to do uh, a topic on the character of Christ. And so this is our study on the character of Christ. So let's start by looking at a scripture verse. Let's look at James 4, 6. So James chapter 4, verse 6. And there it says, But he gives more grace, therefore he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So interesting, there's this dichotomy here where he talks about the proud and the humble. And so if you're prideful, you're arrogant, you believe, well, I'm just better than everyone else. Well, that, it says God resists that. And so we don't want to have that attitude. Another translation says God opposes the proud. And then the humble, those who uh, don't esteem themselves, but lower their, themselves and submit themselves to God. Those are the ones that God esteems and he gives grace to, to the humble, to those. So the first thing to know about Christ's character is that he is humble, right? And so we want to reflect that humility that Christ has. So let's look at another verse. Let's look at Philippians 2 verse 3. That's Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. So here it says, do, not, do nothing out of selfish ambition or empty pride, but in humility consider others more important than yourselves. So this would be an example of what Christ's character is about. It's about not thinking, well, I am great, others need to serve me, others need to do things for me, uh, how do I benefit? It's about what can I do to esteem others, to uplift others, to encourage others, to assist others in need, things of that nature. So we're not, we're not looking about how to benefit ourselves, we're looking for how to benefit those around us. That's what the humble attitude does, and that's Christ's attitude. And I think this is most clearly embodied in Mark 10, 45. So let's look at that. Mark chapter 10, 
verse 45. There it says, For even the Son of Man, referring to Jesus, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So Jesus here, talking about himself, he says, I didn't come here to be served, and he's the word of God in the flesh. So if anyone deserves to be served, it's him. But he says, I didn't come here to be served, even though I'm the king of kings and lord of lords. He says, I came to serve. So if Jesus came to serve, then what about his followers? Should we be here serving? Or would, should we think, well, those around me, they're here to serve, serve me? Well, I think if we're embodying his character, this character of humility, we should have that attitude and say, I'm here to serve, to encourage those around me, to, to help. And so now that we understand that this, this quality of humility is essential to Jesus' character, then the question we should ask ourselves, and that's the kind of the question that is at stake here, is... Is it more Christ-like to humble ourselves when it comes to the animals? So would that mean uh, killing them, saying, well, I want to eat you. That's what my flesh wants. I desire this from you. I want you to be exploited in this way. I want to experiment on you. I want to do all these things uh, to you for myself or for you know me gaining profit from it. Or is it more Christ-like? Is it more humble? to say, well, I'm here to help you, to feed you, to take care of you, to not harm you, to put my own desires uh, beneath uh, this desire to help you and to assist you and to care for you. And so if, let's say, we're thinking, I want to defend someone's freedom to hurt animals, well, is that really humbling ourselves to the animals? Or is that just encouraging someone else to not be humble toward animals? And so we don't want to be arrogant ourselves, esteeming ourselves, uh, but we also don't want to defend someone else's freedom to arrogantly uh, perceive themselves as greater than those around them and to not serve those around them. So I think when it comes to humility, I think the answer is clear that it's more Christ-like to defend animals and to humble ourselves and serve in that way. So that's just the first character. Uh, The next character trait of Christ is that of love. And love is God's essential attribute. If you remember 1 John 4, 16, it says those who abide in God, uh, or abide in love, abide in God. So we want to have that that essential character of God. It says God is love. But if we if we look at sort of a more elaborate list, let's look at Galatians 5, 22, and 23. So Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, because this kind of gives us a list of these Christ-like attributes, because it says these are the fruits of the Spirit, the Spirit of God, and that is the Spirit of Christ. So it says here, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. So this is a list of character traits that would describe the character of Christ. So if we think, well, is it more Christ-like to defend animals or to defend someone's freedom to hurt animals? Well, we can sort of go through this list of of attributes and think, well, uh, which, which of the two is embodying these attributes? So for instance... Uh, would it be more Christ-like to uh, show kindness to animals or to defend someone's freedom to withhold kindness? Well, it says kindness is a fruit of the Spirit, right? And what about peace? Would it be more Christ-like to be peaceful toward the animals? Or would it be more Christ-like to defend someone's freedom to be violent instead of peaceful toward animals? Well, uh, according to these characteristics, it would be more Christ-like to be peaceful, What about love, to show love to the animals, let them live uh, instead of harming them? Or would it be more Christ-like to defend someone's freedom to withhold love from animals? And what about self-control? Is it more Christ-like 
to have control over your flesh and to not desire to kill an animal for clothing or for for the entertainment of sport or for uh, for for food when there's other options available that don't require hurting animals? Or is it more Christ-like to defend someone else's freedom to do all those things? And so I think it would be more Christ-like to embody these character traits ourselves and to encourage others to likewise embody these traits in how we treat animals, treat God's creatures, instead of defending their, their freedom to act contrary to these things, right? So we already read that verse uh, where it says, 1 John 4.16. Actually, let's go there now. 1 John 4.16, since we're on the subject of love. So 1 John 4.16, it says, And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. So we should have this character trait of love because that's God's essential character. That's his quality. And so we want to embody that, and we want to encourage others to likewise embody it and to not defend um, their action that would be contrary to that quality of God. And so if we want sort of another list, let's look at James 3.17. So James chapter 3, verse 17. And there it says, But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. So again, these attributes that if we think of extending these toward animals versus defending someone's freedom to act contrary to these qualities, I think it would be more Christ-like to embody these qualities and to encourage others to do likewise, right? We wouldn't, we wouldn't want to be encouraging people to act contrary to these qualities. So it would therefore be more Christ-like to bear the fruit of the Spirit in how we treat, treat animals, rather than defending someone's freedom to bear the opposite fruit in how they treat animals. So one of the qualities in that list that we just read is mercy, So it says, full of mercy and good fruits. So let's talk about that next, because that's the third quality. We have humility, we have love, and now we have mercy as one of Christ's essential qualities, our character traits. So let's look at Luke 6.36. This is a short one. If you haven't memorized this one by now, it's a good one to memorize. So Luke 6.36, it says, Therefore be merciful, just as your Father also is merciful. And this isn't referring to you know, our, our earthly male parent figure. It's referring to God as our Heavenly Father. So just as God is merciful toward all of us, toward all of creation, we should likewise be merciful toward all of God's creation and toward each other. And so if we're going to embody this character trait of mercy, well, is it more Christ-like to show mercy to animals by defending them? Or is it more merciful to defend someone's freedom to withhold mercy from animals? And I think that it would be more Christ-like to defend the animals here, right, when it comes to mercy. So let's look at Matthew 18.33. Matthew 18.33. This requires a little bit of context. So Matthew 18.33 says, Should you not also have had compassion or mercy on your fellow servant, just as I had pity uh, or mercy on you? And so this is a, a parable here. It's Uh, A parable that uh, I really like because it really shows this quality of God being merciful and being compassionate and being uh, a forgiving God, and that he really wants us to do the same. 
So this person has a huge debt and uh, his master, instead of giving him more time to pay it off, he just forgives it and says, you know what, this debt that's so big you couldn't ever possibly repay it, I'm forgiving it, you owe me nothing. And then the servant who's forgiven this enormous debt uh, goes in instead of extending that same forgiveness, that same mercy to someone else who owes him a small debt, he instead is ruthless toward that person and says, you must pay me back this debt, even grabs him by the neck. And so then whenever the master finds out about it, he says, well, what did you do? Why didn't you show mercy and forgiveness the way I did toward you? And then he's like, well, now that huge debt that you couldn't pay back, well, now you owe it to me again. And so the, the, the sort of theme of the story here, Jesus says at the end in verse 35, so my heavenly father also will do, do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. So this idea of extending mercy, uh, extending this forgiveness, extending this love to those around us is this thing that God is calling all of us to do. And he's, he's basically demonstrating through this parable that God is so loving toward us, so forgiving toward us, so merciful toward us, not because we deserve it, but because of his character. He loves us and he's just that way. And so we receive all of this love and mercy from God. And what he asks us to do then in return is to extend the same love and mercy and forgiveness to those around us. And so when it comes to animals, should we be extending this mercy, uh, this love, this, uh, this forgiveness, this, I guess, forgiveness, uh, uh, but like all of these character traits of showing compassion for these animals, should we extend that toward animals or should we withhold it? And should we defend others who are withholding it from his creatures? And so I think that if we really want to embody the fullness of what this mercy is, we have to acknowledge first that the mercy comes from God to us. The love comes from God to us. He shows it to us first. And then he says to us, now you, who I have shown mercy to, go and show mercy to those around you. And so we want to show that mercy, including to God's creatures. And so then let's look at uh, 1 John 4.19. So back to essentially where we just were. So 1 John 4.19. So remember, we read in 16 that God is love and that we should be abiding in love. But then in 19, it says, we love him because he first loved us. Or as the BSB translation says, we love because he first loved us. And so we wouldn't be able to love. We wouldn't be able to show this trait at all if it weren't God's character that he's giving to us uh, to express. And so it, it's God's love that's being expressed through us. And so which is more Christ-like? Well, it, the more Christ-like thing, I think, would be to express that love, to express that mercy, right? So we have mercy, we have humility, we have love. And another Christ-like trait, another character that we see throughout the, the life of Christ is caring for the most vulnerable. So when it comes to caring for the most vulnerable, let's look at James 127. That's James chapter 1, verse 27. It says, Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble, and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Or as another translation says, pure and undefiled religion before our God and Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself from being polluted or corrupted by the world. So why widows and orphans? Why is that significant? Well, the reason that widows and orphans are chosen is because they represent the most vulnerable where in this sort of patriarchal society uh, throughout you know, Bible times, a, 
a father figure, a husband, that would be the provider for the family. And so if that provider figure now no longer exists, so he, he dies and he leaves a wife and children behind, well, that wife can't just go and get a job and support the family. There's not some you know, welfare system in place to, to assist people uh, in that predicament. And the children, well, they no longer have a father figure either. And so the provider of the family is no longer there. So now they're sort of at the mercy to whoever is willing and able to help them. And so they're considered the most vulnerable. And of course, uh, the natural reaction that somebody might have, or at least the common reaction is, well, that's not my responsibility. I have my own responsibilities and that's enough for me. Like, I'm not going to take on these new responsibilities of this, you know, this widow and these orphans. And so they end up falling through the, the, the cracks and nobody's helping them. And so he's saying the most pure expression of the sort of love that comes from God, this, this humble, selfless love, uh, this Christ-like love, is caring for those that the rest of society sort of wants to not care for, wants to ignore. Um, and so that's why widows and orphans are chosen for this example. And so let's look at uh, where this is kind of talked about in a slightly different way, where let's look at Luke 20, 46 and 47. So Luke 20, 46 and 47. It says, and this is Jesus speaking. Beware of the scribes who desire to walk in long robes Love greetings in the marketplaces, the best seats in the synagogues, and the best places at feasts. So they love all the attention that comes with their position, their status. They love to really relish in it. They love being that person. And 47, who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers, these will receive greater condemnation. So the the part of these verses that I want to focus on here is devour widows' houses. So if we think of pure and undefiled religion is looking after the widows and the orphans and saying, look, you who no longer have a provider figure and can't uh, take care of yourselves and need somebody to show you mercy and kindness in order for your own bare necessities of survival uh, to, to be procured, well, you, pure and undefiled, uh, undefiled religion, is supposed to be caring for you. But instead, these people who are supposed to represent religion, these scribes and Pharisees, uh, instead what they're doing is they're devouring widows' houses. They're saying, oh, well, there's an opportunity for me to take your house, too. You no longer have an income. You're struggling, and so now let me take your house as well and everything you have. So they're looking at it as an, as an opportunity to pounce and take even more from someone who has so little. And so basically they're embodying this hypocrisy, this opposite trait that pure and undefiled religion is supposed to have. And that's why Jesus says they'll receive greater condemnation because they're, they're being malicious instead of malevolent, uh, benevolent. And so when it comes to animals, well, I can't think of somebody who's more vulnerable than animals, especially the animals used in animal agriculture and clothing industry, uh, basically any sort of animal that humans want to harm, which is almost every animal. And so are we embodying the spirit of pure and undefiled religion if we're defending someone's freedom to devour animals the way these scribes were devouring widows' houses? Uh, taking the lives of these animals who have their, uh, their mothers, their fathers, their brothers and sisters uh, killed and taken away and slaughtered, well, should we be looking after them? Should we be defending them? Uh, or should we be defending the practice of people doing this to these animals? And I think that if we think of Christ as uh, embodying all of these attributes of caring for the most vulnerable, then I think the more Christ-like thing would be to care for the vulnerable animals. And it says to do that in Proverbs 12.10. So let's look at that. 
That's Proverbs chapter 12, verse 10. It says, a righteous man cares for the needs of his animal, but the kindest acts of the, of the wicked are cruel. So we want to regard the lives of animals. We don't want to ignore them and be cruel to animals and defend people's freedom to be cruel to animals. Because that would be defending wickedness instead of defending righteousness. We want to embody righteousness instead of defending wickedness. So Jesus, he's humble, he shows love, he shows mercy, he cares for the most vulnerable. And another thing Jesus does is speak up for those who need someone to speak up for them. So let's look at, stay in Proverbs, and let's look at 31.8. So Proverbs chapter 31, verse 8. It says, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves in the cause of all who are appointed to die. So this one's interesting because if we think of what happens in animal agriculture, let's say uh, a baby calf is born. Well, they'll literally stamp on that calf's ear the day they are born a number. And on that number, it has their kill date. So the, the exact day that they're appointed to die is stamped on their ear the day they are born. And so when it says to speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, well, animals don't have a voice. Uh, they're just being treated as these commodities. And the only voices for them are animal defenders. So it says speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves in the cause of all who are appointed to die. Well, these animals, like I said, are appointed to die the day they are born. So would it be more Christ-like to speak up for these animals? Or would it be more Christ-like to defend the actions of those who are doing these things to the animals? And so speaking up for and liberating those who are locked in cages, inside factory farms, awaiting their appointed time to die, a time that is often stamped on their ear the day they are born. And let's look at... Let's look at Isaiah 58, 6. So Isaiah 58, verse 6. There it says, Is this not the fast that I have chosen to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens? to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke. So here, this is the, it says it's the fast I have chosen, meaning this is really what I want you to do. If you're, if you're following my will, this is, of course, God speaking, is uh, to do these things. And this, these examples are all about liberating those who are oppressed, those who are in bondage, those who are in chains, those who are uh, being imprisoned and forced to do labor, have no freedom. And it's saying those who are being held captive, we want to liberate. That's what God wants us to do. Is to, that's his justice, is to liberate those who are being held captive. And if we think of all these illustrations being used to describe those being in bondage, we think of breaking every yoke. Well, what's a yoke? That's an instrument you would put on the necks of animals to perform labor. And the, the heavy burdens, loose the bonds of wickedness, let the oppressed go free. It's like these illustrations, they could apply to people who are in bondage, but the yoke especially, it's really describing these things that we're doing to animals when we're exploiting them. And so only by analogy could we understand these things applying also to humans. And so would it be more Christ-like to loose the bonds of wickedness against animals, to undo the heavy burdens that animals are bearing, to let the oppressed animals go free, and to break the, the, uh, every yoke that is upon the neck of animals? Or would it be more Christ-like to defend the oppressors who are treating animals this way? So should we be going into zoos and aquariums and other animal prisons and uh, liberating them, or at least 
speaking out to, uh, to end these practices? Or are we giving them our money to bring our children there to watch animals be uh, imprisoned in this way? So as it pertains to animals, are we coming to their defense by breaking their yokes, undoing their heavy burdens, and liberating them from their bondage? Or are we instead defending the freedoms of those who hurt animals in this way? So if we think of Jesus, was there an example of Jesus doing something like this? Well, let's look at John 2.15. So John chapter 2, verse 15. Now, interestingly, for those who are unaware, uh, this event that, uh, that we're about to talk about, it happens here at the beginning of the Gospel of John. Sometimes people think it's it only happened once, but uh, just like the the priest would cleanse the temple, and if there was still the disease, still the corruption, then he would come in and cleanse it again. Well, uh, given that this happened at the beginning of the Gospel of John, and in the other Gospel accounts, it happens toward the end of his ministry, uh, it's likely that it probably happened at least twice. And so uh, let's, let's look at what this says. It says, John 2.16. And he said to those who sold doves, this is Jesus, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. And that was 16. Let's read 15 as well. When he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the money changers, money, and overturned the tables. So he goes in there into the temple where they're buying and selling animals to be slaughtered, to be sacrificed, and he overturns the tables he throws all their money that they're from those who are buying and selling the animals, people who are exchanging money, and he opens the cages, releases the animals, cracks the whip, getting the animals to stampede and run out of the, of the temple. So he's liberating all these animals that are being sold. He doesn't turn to the money changers and say, hey guys, uh, I think you're overcharging. And like, that was it. No, no, no. It was, this wasn't about the money changers. This was about making the temple a place of business where they're selling animals to be slaughtered, sacrificed, and he was doing away with all of that. And so what should we do when it comes to being Christ-like and and how to embody these characteristics of, as it says in that Isaiah passage, to release those who are uh, oppressed and as it says in that Proverbs verse, to speak up for those who are appointed to die. Well, are we being Christ-like by speaking up for them and liberating the oppressed? Or are we doing the opposite and defending those who are uh, oppressing them and imprisoning them? So the next thing let's think about is preaching the gospel message, because that was one of the most important things in the life of Jesus. Let's look at Luke 4.43. That's Luke chapter 4 and verse 43. So Jesus says, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also, because for this purpose I have been sent. So Jesus is saying, this is the purpose that I've been sent, is to preach this good news, this good news of the kingdom, this gospel message. Uh, Now, of course, he had, you know, a a lot of purposes. This isn't the one purpose, but he says, for this purpose, I've been sent. This is a big deal. This is a huge part of the life of Jesus, is spreading this, this message of the kingdom of God. And so just as that was a huge part of Jesus's life and his purpose, he says that's what he wants us to do as well. So we have the Great Commission in Matthew uh, 28. Uh, we also have Mark 16, 15. So Mark 16, 15. And Jesus said to them, meaning talking to his followers, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So this is what Jesus instructed his, uh, his followers to do. 
is just as he was preaching the gospel, he wants his followers to likewise preach the gospel. And that he says this was his purpose. He says, for this purpose, I came. And so that's also our purpose as his followers, as his disciples, is that we should also make it a very high priority to preach this gospel to everyone. It doesn't say to some. It says to every creature. And so we want to be preaching that gospel message far and wide. And if there's something that we're doing that's hindering our ability to reach an audience with this life-saving message, then we need to really prioritize this message instead of whatever that thing is that's hindering our message. And so if we look at, uh, let's say, Romans 14, 15. Let's look at Romans 14, 15. If you have any questions, be sure to ask those in the chat. So Romans 14, 15. Yet if your brother is grieved because of your food, you are no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. So here this is a discussion of eating food that was offered to idols. Um, but when we're talking about the principle that's applied, Paul's saying, don't put... Uh, your freedom. Don't put your desires above your ability to be in fellowship, above preaching the gospel message, above these things that are more important than these temporary pleasures and things of that nature. And so we want to not withhold love. We, want, we don't want to forget about what's really important uh, for the sake of these other things. And so it's really important to, to focus on I guess the, mo the most important thing is this life-saving message, right? So let's take an unbelieving animal defender, and they're trying to convince you to show love and mercy and kindness toward animals, and you're trying to convince them to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior so that they can have eternal life in God's kingdom, right? So you both have a message that you both feel really passionate about and feel is very important, and they're not hearing you because you're not hearing them. And this thing that they're preaching to you is this message of love and kindness and mercy. And you're like, I want none of that. God gave me permission or whatever other excuse that's being used. But let me tell you about this God of love and mercy and kindness. And he wants us to be loving and merciful and kindness. And they're just like, yeah, I'm following. So how come you're doing the opposite when it comes to animals? And it's like, well, it's because God doesn't care about animals, but he wants us to do those things toward people. And it's like, so this is your loving and merciful and kind God. And so basically, if the unbelieving animal defender is on the side of showing love and compassion to animals, and the believer is on the side of withholding love and compassion, then how is the believer going to communicate the love and compassion of God to the unbelieving animal defender, right? So I've experienced this lots of times, uh, talking with animal defenders who uh, are not following Jesus, who haven't accepted him as their savior. And I can pretty much predict the conversation like clockwork, that they're basically like, yeah, I had conversations with other Christians trying to convince them to be vegan. And they basically would point to different scripture verses saying, this is why I can withhold all these traits when it comes to animals, uh, but then trying to convince you to believe in their God. And so they're like, well, I just see you as a hypocrite, that you're trying to preach this love and kindness and mercy, but then you yourselves are resisting uh, showing those traits to God's creatures. And so that's how you're not able to preach that gospel message to this audience, and you're putting your freedoms above your ability to reach these lost individuals. And so Paul says all kinds of things about how we shouldn't uh, put our freedoms above uh, our ability to uh, reach out to others. So that would be another thing is, would it be more Christ-like? Well, it would be more Christ-like to prioritize the importance of this gospel message uh, instead of prioritizing our freedom to herd animals. And so if we can kind of all, all look at this together as a whole, 
Let's look at Galatians 5.13. So Galatians chapter 5, we're going to look at verse 13. It says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. So again, we don't want to say, oh, well, I'm free. God gave me permission. I'm you know, free to, to hurt animals, and that doesn't affect my salvation, or you know, whatever other reason that we're using to justify hurting animals. We shouldn't be defending that freedom. We should be defending the animals. That's what it would be more Christ-like to be doing, is we should be humbling ourselves, serving, having that attitude of service. Remember, Jesus says, I, I didn't come to be served, but to serve. And so for his followers, we should be doing likewise, following that example. And so if we're saying, well, God gave us dominion, and that's why we don't have to care about animals, they're here to serve me. Well, of course, he says in the next verse, uh, eat the fruit of the tree and the green plants of the ground, that shall be your food. So that's what truly godly dominion would entail. But aside from that, well, that dominion in God's image and likeness, that would also mean serving instead of being served. And so, yeah, we have dominion over animals. We should exercise that dominion in a Christ-like way. And that would be serving instead of being served by those we have dominion over. So we want to not indulge the flesh, where the flesh says, well, I want to kill that animal and eat the animal. Uh, we should be instead serving with humility. So let's look at uh, one last verse. Let's look at Micah 6, 8. Micah 6, 8. I think this is a good closing verse. So Micah chapter 6, verse 8 says, He has shown you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. So when it comes to defending animals or defending someone's freedom to, to hurt animals, are we acting justly? Are we showing justice to the anim animals? like it says in that passage in Isaiah about breaking every yoke and liberating the oppressed. Uh, are we showing love to animals? Are we showing mercy to animals? Or are we defending someone's freedom to withhold love and mercy? And are we humbling ourselves, walking humbly with our God? Or are we arrogantly puffing ourselves up and saying, I'm better than the animals. They're here to serve me. I can do to them whatever I want. And you, I'll defend your freedom to do whatever you want to the animals. Or are we humbling ourselves and serving those uh, whom God gave us dominion over? So hopefully, uh, when it comes to which is more Christ-like, I think uh, the answer should be pretty clear. The more Christ-like thing would be to defend animals rather than defending someone's freedom to hurt animals. So if you have any questions, be sure to ask in the chat. Get to that now. One way to defend animals and to speak up for them is to put stickers on your water bottle that starts the conversation. You can get those through PETA if you want. All right, Brian, hello everyone. Hi, Brian, thanks for joining us. Claudia, hello. Robert, Roslyn, Tanya, Fred, Tracy, Kathy. See, as we continue to think about ways to share this church's messages, please consider bringing a friend to these live talks or invite a friend and watch one or more over a meal. It's a good idea, Kathy. So if you believe that somebody should hear this message, be sure to share that with them. Uh, whenever we finish the live, it immediately is archived on our Facebook page, Creation Care Church. You can also find it on YouTube, Creation Care Church. Uh, but we'd love to have you join us live as well. Angel, hi, thanks for joining us. Evelyn, 
Okay, Psalm 36, 6, O Lord, thou preservest man and beast. Yes, that's true. Where in some translations it says, God preserves both man and animal, and other translations it says, God saves both human and animal. So in either case, it's clear that God loves animals and cares for them, and we should do likewise. It doesn't say, and God defends the massacre of animals by humans. It doesn't say that it says it preserves both man and beast. So we want to embody that character of God and do likewise. Let's see, the Lord is love and mercy. Thank you for preaching the truth. And thank you for being here. See, it occurs to me that Christians really have no excuse. Once understanding dominion, it is clear to see that as those created in God's image, we are to serve the rest of creation, not just other humans. People think the rest of creation is ours to use, but a better understanding would be to see that all creation is to function in harmony together. And we were given that particular task, that mandate, to see that this is done. The only part of creation he gave us to use if Christians must think this way, is the land and the plants. Yet here again, uh, we are to till it lovingly and keep it, protect it from being misused or destroyed. Yeah, so it says in Genesis, I believe, 2.15, that he put us in the garden to tend and keep the garden, meaning uh, to preserve, to take care of, to watch over, to be the guardians of. And in that garden would be not just the earth, but also the animals that were inhabiting that, that earth. And so we're the ones who have dominion, we're the caretakers of all of creation. And so that role that he gave us, he says he created us to do so in his image and likeness. So we're supposed to embody this Christ-like character and how we exercise that dominion. Let's see, Tanya. Um, God's dominion he gave us, mankind, is to care for and protect. Just as Jesus overturned the tables, it is our duty to speak up for God's animals and care for all God's creations. Exactly. I agree. And so, yeah, just as God protects us, so we think of how does Jesus care for us? He says, the, the good shepherd cares for the sheep even to the point of laying down his life for the sheep. It doesn't say Jesus defends someone's freedom to hurt the sheep. It's Jesus will defend the sheep, will even go after one of the sheep uh, and leave the 99 to go after that one. And so we should have a similar attitude when it comes to dominion, where we should, we should think about the animals as these creatures that are beloved by God and that we have this opportunity where God entrusts us to take care of these creatures of his. And so we should not just think of that as an opportunity to do whatever we want. We should think of it as an opportunity to serve God. Let's see, Fred, I have really seen that coldness of Christians toward vegans who spoke for the compassion and alienated them, alienated them. Yeah, uh, I've definitely seen a lot of it. In fact, I often get a lot of backlash from other animal defenders whenever I tell them about uh, my ministry and my faith. Uh, they'll sort of come at me a lot of times with sort of animosity and built up frustration where they'll say things like, you know, how can you even be an animal defender if you care about that nonsense, if you believe in that heartless God and I'm just like, okay, well, let's have that conversation. I don't know who you've been talking to, but apparently they haven't been telling you about the God that I believe in because my God is a God of love and mercy and compassion and kindness. And so that's often a conversation starter. And it, uh, I find it disheartening when I see so many fellow Christians who have such what, what seems to be callousness and like they don't even care to reach out to such people. And they're like, well, I tried. I told, you know, told them in the Bible, God doesn't care about animals. That wasn't enough for them. So I guess they're just going to burn in hell or whatever. 
And I'm just like, really? That's your attitude? We should have the, the opposite attitude. We should humble ourselves. Like, even if you're not going to change and start caring about animals, at least change your attitude toward how you're approaching people who do care about animals. Because you're making my job a lot more difficult to reach these people. And at least, at least have a, a, a humility to acknowledge that, okay, these people are doing something that is Christ-like. Even if they don't know the fullness of Christ, because maybe nobody's ever taught them in the right way. But at least what you're doing is showing love and kindness and mercy to animals. And those are qualities that God wants us to embody. And so use that as the conversation starter and be like, okay, well, you're doing the things that God called us to do, at least when it comes to animals. And so now let's build on that foundation and let me tell you about Jesus. Uh, instead, it often goes the other direction where they're just like, well, you know, you're believing in nonsense, you're following a demon or whatever other kind of things, and then kind of leave it to me to clean up the mess, which is fine. But I just would really wish that more Christians would would have this attitude that Paul talks about of really prioritizing reaching everyone with the gospel message and not just thinking, well, those people are showing more love to animals than me, so I'm going to like just you know, defend my own pride since I'm not helping animals and I'm hurting animals. And so, you know, I'm going to spend that conversation defending my own actions instead of preaching the gospel to this person. So I think if we just had a different attitude uh, toward animals and toward defenders of animals, uh, that would be a huge benefit to the spreading of the gospel. Let's see, Tanya, Etsy has lots of great animal rights stickers too. Good idea. Yep. Let's see. So there's one other question that was asked, not here, but elsewhere. So whenever we were talking about the Jesus cleansing the temple. I gave that as an example of him liberating animals. When it says in Isaiah, you know, to liberate those who are oppressed, and then I said that was an example of Jesus doing that to animals, where it says he freed all the animals that were being sold there. And some people, they, they want to say, well, no, actually, it wasn't about liberating the animals. It was just about, like, the money changers ripping people off. And so that was, that was what was going on there. And so I want to kind of address this, this question, because I think that is the common misconception, and I think that tends to be kind of a habit that people have, uh, where whenever anything is in Scripture about God caring about animals, um, we just kind of try to interpret it in some other way that kind of totally ignores the parts about animals. And I think that's kind of what's happening here, and that's missing a huge part of the message. So if you remember in Luke 19, 45 and 46, it says, Then Jesus entered the temple courts and began to drive out those who were selling there. He declared to them, It is written, My house will be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. And so people would say, Well, this just has to do with the money changers. However, where is the money changers even mentioned in this verse? Right? And so this account of Jesus cleansing the temple is in all four of the Gospels, but in the Luke account here, the money changers are not even mentioned. So this omission indicates that those selling animals were the primary antagonists, and the money changers were more peripheral to Jesus's purpose in disrupting the temple business. Uh, if his main purpose had been condemning dishonest business practices, uh, it would have been more fitting for him to quote one of the many scripture passages about weighted scales and corrupt trading. There's a lot of that in Proverbs. It says, don't use weighted scales. And so if he's like, well, you're just being dishonest in your business practices, you're ripping people off. Well, why wouldn't he have quoted one of those verses? Instead, he quotes, uh, my father's house should be a house of prayer. You make it a den of robbers. Um, and here he's referencing Jeremiah 7:11, a chapter about God instructing obedience and not animal sacrifice. As it says further in that chapter, Jeremiah 7, 22, For I did not speak to your fathers or command them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings or sacrifices. 
And so why would he be quoting these verses about ending animal sacrifices, about God not wanting these, not desiring animal sacrifices? And that's what he's doing is he's disrupting this business, freeing the animals that were being sold to be sacrificed to God. He wouldn't be quoting those verses if it was all about just, you know, the dis dishonest business practices of the money changers. And the money changers would at least be mentioned in all four accounts, right? If it was about the money changers, but they're not even mentioned in the Luke account. So I think people who uh, kind of dig in their heels and say, no, 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 that's all that was about. They're missing a huge part of what Jesus was doing there. So uh, that's kind of the, an important point that I wanted to draw out there. Let's see, we're running short on time, but... Uh, See, next question. Uh, I had this conversation with a church member who had a stroke. Let's see. Let's see, what do you say to those Christians who believe and teach a reduction of overall consumption of animal products and move to higher welfare sourcing? So this is a good question, and... I think it kind of depends on where you're coming from. So, of course, doing less harm is better than doing more harm, right? So if somebody says, hey, I want to teach for someone to do less harm, I would be like, great, you know, less harm is better than more harm. But then there also sort of comes a danger if you're sort of condoning something that's less than good and you're saying, well, this is less bad than what you're currently doing, so do that okay, that would be a step in the right direction, but I think there, e there needs to be a goal to not just do less bad, but to not do the bad at all. And so if you're saying, well, this is a first step, do that, but here's the goal, it's to not do the harm at all, then okay, great, that you're putting them on the path to no longer causing that harm. But if you just say, here's a way to cause less harm, and that's fine. That's that's all I'm asking you to do. Then you're you're kind of leaving them without that goal of not doing the harm. So uh, I would say that any time that somebody teaches to reduce uh, the harm, whether it's you know meatless Mondays or um, you know uh, I guess whatever like humane slaughter. That's kind of a nonsensical term anyway. But uh, yeah, any sort of Showing more kindness. I know that some of the animal rights campaigns, they they fight for better conditions for animals and animal agriculture. So they want larger cages for animals in factory farms. And yeah, that makes the animal's life a little bit less torturous. So that's an overall good thing. But if that's where you stop, then you're falling kind of well short of the goal. The goal needs to liberate the animals altogether, to completely change someone's attitude toward animals. It's where we no longer see them as a commodity to be explored, exploited and harmed and tortured and imprisoned, but instead as someone, a being capable of love and deserving of our kindness and our mercy. And so uh, if, if we fall short of that message, we want to make sure to change our message to where we definitely give them that goal and say, really, this is what we should be doing. This is what we should be working toward. And if you want to set like a an intermediate goal and say, okay, well, today, can you stop doing these things? Can you commit to this? Great, but don't leave off what the end goal is. That would be what I would suggest. All right, so let's talk about next week's topic. And for those who I haven't gotten to yet in your questions, uh, I can respond to that in the comments. So next week's topic is, did Jesus eat lamb? So we're approaching Passover and uh, the Resurrection Resurrection Sunday. And so in anticipation of those things, there's this question that comes up each year is, well, the disciples gathered together and it says in Scripture that they were observing Passover. And well, in Passover, according to Scripture, they would sacrifice a lamb and eat the lamb. And so if Jesus and his disciples were observing Passover, does that mean Jesus ate lamb? So that's the question we're going to investigate next week. And given the, the timeliness of it, that Passover is, is coming, it's arriving uh, the week after, then 
we want to we want to kind of really look into this question and see uh, what evidence there is that he did and what evidence is there that he didn't. And then, of course, the more important question, what bearing should this evidence have on our lives? What should we do? So we'd love to have you there. And if you could invite someone to join us for for that talk as well. All right, let's let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your kindness. And uh, thank you for giving us uh, your spirit, those who believe in you, that you'll pour out your spirit uh, on us. And thank you for being a forgiving God, a God who loves us so much that this, this debt that we couldn't possibly repay, uh, that you have forgiven us. And that all you call us to do is to go and sin no more and to put our faith in you and to just walk according to your ways. And just that you'll even do that for us by putting your spirit in us. And just thank you for being a God who, who had this plan from the beginning of creation, uh, that you would not let us die in our sins, but you would come to save us. So we just thank you for that. And we pray for the salvation of the whole world as well. And we just ask that uh, all those who are not saved, all those who have not accepted you, uh, as their Lord and their Savior, and who do not walk according to your ways, uh, just that their eyes and ears would be opened and their hearts uh, would cry out to you and that you would save them and you would reveal yourself to them. You would put it on their minds and on their hearts to follow you and love you with all their heart and that we could all reflect your character in the world to both humans and to all of your creation, including the animals. So we pray all this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. So thank you for joining us, and we look forward to having you again next week. God bless.